So hi, everybody. Welcome to our Governance Made Easy webinar today titled Cultural Liter Literacy, the Rules of Belonging with Fiona Robinson. My name is Sean McDonald, and I will be your moderator for the next 45 minutes. Uh, firstly, thanks for attending today. We appreciate the effort uh, you've made to be here for our live event. Now, today's format is a little different to our normal webinar formats, as today we are privileged to have Fiona Robertson with us. Fiona will give us a 30-minute presentation, which will then be followed by an open Q&A session. So for this, um, please use your Q&A button on your Zoom toolbar, and it might be easier if you type in your questions uh, as we move through the actual uh, presentation itself. And finally, if you stay through till the end, which we hope you will do, of course, and as is customary for the Board Pro webinars, we have a special treat for you. By answering our one-minute one minute survey at the end of the webinar, you'll go into the draw to win our beautiful gift hamper worth $400. Now, for those that uh, don't know uh, much about Board Pro, we are a board software provider, sometimes called a board portal, that serve around 20,000 users around the world, and we're in about 26 countries. We help organizations to prepare for and run their board meetings more effectively and efficiently with, you guessed it, clever software, um, and certainly with less time, and we deliver more impact and value for the organization. And as much as we are a board software provider, part of our wider mission is to make the fundamentals of governance free and easy to implement for all organizations, especially those with resource constraints. Now, we do this by hosting these types of webinars, our Governance Made Easy webinars and our popular masterclasses. We also have an extensive resource library on our website that is home to hundreds of templates, checklists, guides and white papers, which are all available for the small price of your email address. Now, Fiona Robinson is an expert in organizational culture, leadership and teamwork who holds an MBA from London Business School and is a graduate of the Australian Institute of Company Directors and the Institute of Executive Coaching and Leadership. She is the former head of culture for the National Australia Bank, where she spent about 12 years in senior executive positions, and she is now an independent speaker, facilitator, executive coach and author. Fiona has consulted to dozens of large and blue chip organisations domestically and internationally with all levels of governance in Australia and coached numerous senior executive teams. Clients of Fiona include Monash University, PEXA, La Trobe University, Osgrid, IBM, NASDAQ, Oracle and McKinsey. Fiona's book, Rules of Belonging, Change Your Organisational Culture, Delight Your People and Turbocharge Your Results – was published in 2020. So I'd like to hand over to Fiona now to uh, start the next segment of our webinar. Over to you, Fiona. Thanks very much, Sean. Um, so uh, we're going to switch over to my screen so that I can um, uh, control the, the clicking of the button. Um, yes, when you reminded me that the book was published in 2020, I remember um, somebody saying it, it was July 2020, incidentally, so uh, I think that's all burned into our memories. Um, I was uh, One of my friends said to me, just as well, you didn't write a book about, um, you know, starting an airline. Um, I was very yeah. lucky, I think, with the timing of it. Um, yeah. All right, so um, thank you for having me today. I'm really looking forward to sharing uh, the idea, the core idea Um that culture is the rules of belonging. So that's the hypothesis that I put to you today. What I'm going to be inviting you to do is to reflect on a couple of questions in your own mind as we go through. And as Sean said, please do feel free to add any questions you have into the Q&A um, button in your toolbar, and I'll endeavour to address some of those uh, in the time that we have available at the end. So the questions I would like you to reflect upon are, firstly, does this idea ring true for you? So does it fit with your lived experience as I go through and explain why uh, I believe this is a good um, uh, core idea for culture? The second question is, how does this relate? How does this idea relate specifically to your work? So in whatever role that you are in, whether you're um, in a, a board role or a, a management role or some blend of those two. So does it ring true? How is it relevant to you specifically? So 
The reason that I think that this is worth explaining is because I think that culture has been very much overcomplicated. I believe that it is not easy, but it is simple. And so the idea of the rules of belonging is designed to make culture much more accessible than it might otherwise have been uh, in the past so that you can see it, so that you can deliberately decide what you want it to be, so that you can actively shift it from wherever it is now to wherever you want it to be. And what I'm talking about is the culture of your team, whether you're a member of a team or a leader of one or both, uh, or the culture of your organisation. So that's the idea. Let's see how we go in convincing you that this is a useful one. So to begin with, I'd like to ask you to imagine the full history of our planet Earth, four and a half billion years or so. Imagine that collapsed down into the equivalent of one year. So if that were the case, then the asteroid that killed the dinosaurs arrived at about the third week of September in our notional year. Then took a very long time for the Earth to be repopulated with birds and mammals about the third week of November. The very earliest human beings arrived on planet Earth at noon on the 31st of December in our notional year, just in time to put up the decorations for the New Year's Eve party. This matters because there are, in fact, two distinct types of evolution that have happened on our planet, and we don't often reflect on the fact that there are, there are two. So the first is the obvious, biological or genetic evolution, survival of the fittest Darwin, all of that. We know how it works. It is glacially slow, and if you were to plot it over time, it's essentially on a flat line over time. But about 80,000 years ago, um, the human, human beings began to speak. We began to share ideas directly with one another, and that enabled us to have a completely new type of culture, and that is, I uh, beg your pardon, a new type of evolution, and that is cultural evolution. Cultural evolution is not glacially slow. Cultural evolution is not on a flat line over time. Cultural evolution is on an exponential curve. So, interesting to reflect on the fact that we've had Beyonce longer than we've had Facebook. Um, we've had social media on this planet for only 17 years. So, in our notional year, humans about 200,000 years ago showed up at noon on the 31st of December. The Roman Empire happened at about five minutes to midnight. And social media is a nanosecond in our exponential curve. We are at vertical and it's only going to accelerate from here. The implication is that our biology and the environment in which we are operating that biology are, have a mismatch, a large and growing mismatch. Human beings are not designed for the environment, not, have not evolved for, are not optimised for the environment that we have created. Our brains are not optimised for online immersive gaming. They're not optimised for options trading. They're not optimised for sitting in boardrooms and listening to PowerPoint presentations. And they're particularly not optimised for Zoom meetings, incidentally. So mm. if you have found yourself completely exhausted by the end <coughs> of a day of Zoom meetings, there's a very good biological reason for that. There is great research that shows that if you and I were actually sitting within six feet of one another right now, your subconscious would know what my pulse rate is and vice versa. The subconscious mind is working at far greater volume and speed than the conscious mind. It is reading micro expressions constantly. It is reading pheromones constantly. There are mirror neurons in my brain that make your emotions literally contagious to me. And so when we're sitting on the opposite side of a screen from one another, our brains get very confused. Our subconscious can see a human being in front of us, but it can't do its job. And so the conscious mind, therefore, has to work about 10 times harder and it has to try and read the micro expressions and has to try and read the emotions of everybody on the screen. You know, the awkward moment when someone asks a question on a Zoom meeting and you've got no idea who's allowed to talk. If you're sitting in a room together, you just know your subconscious would do a lot of that work for you. So there are very good reasons why you're exhausted by the end of a day of Zoom meetings. And that is the main reason. So brain's not optimised for the environment that we're in. Brains are optimised for this. The human brain is primarily a threat detection, pattern recognition 
machine. Its job is to go the last five times there was a rustle in the grass, it was a lion. The next time there's a rustle in the grass, probably a lion, I should run now. And so because it's constantly scanning our environment for threats and looking for patterns, our behaviour is shaped far more by that phenomenon than we often recognise. There's a quite disturbing example of this, actually, that happened before the pandemic um, in New York City in Times Square. There was this, uh, you can Google this if you're interested, there was a, um, a motorcycle that started to backfire and people believed that what they were hearing was automatic gunfire and thousands of people panicked and ran. Um, I've now spoken to three different Australians who were in that location on that day, none of the Australians ran. They all believed that they were hearing backfiring. The Americans believed that they were hearing gunfire. So the human brain is scanning our environment for threats, seeing patterns and coming to very fast conclusions about those threats. That's what our brain is optimised for, not for the environment that we have created. This is relevant to culture because when we join a new group, we have evolutionary superpowers that enable us to observe in great detail the behaviour of our new group. I've asked this question now of thousands of people uh, in many different types of forums. And the kind of answers that they will give me are, you know, for example, uh, when I start a new job or jo join a new board might be a more relevant example for you. Um, before joining that group, there are a whole lot of higher order things that go through my mind. Of course, I'm thinking, can I add the value that the role is meant to add to the system that I'm joining? Do I have the right expertise? And so on. All of the sort of higher order stuff, of course, we think about. There's a whole lot of other stuff that we usually don't talk about, but we often think about. Things like, will they like me? Will I fit into the new group? Where are the boundaries, the social boundaries in this particular group? Um, and really basic things. I mean, back in the days when we all came to an office every day, uh, I know there's lots of people still doing that, but there's lots of people aren't. But back in the days when that was the complete norm, we would also think about things like what time is it okay for me to show up in the morning and what time is it okay, maybe more importantly, to go home at the end of the day? And what are we wearing? You know, is it, you know, pearls and high heels and full makeup and hair and an updo? Or is it, you know, pants and flats and all of the rest of it. And incidentally, if you're female, that question is far more fraught than if you're a male. So we think about this stuff. We think about it because belonging is a fundamental need of human beings. So there is a piece of research that I think is useful to illustrate how the brain works in more detail. The human brain is incapable of distinguishing between social pain and physical pain, which is an astonishing idea. If you're interested in learning more, this book, um, this is written by my favourite researcher. His name is Matthew Lieberman. He heads up the cognitive uh, neuroscience team at UCLA, written this book, one word title, Social. His team did an experiment that proved that the human brain could not distinguish between social pain and physical pain. I'm going to describe it to you very briefly. So uh, what they did was they put the subject of the experiment into a functional MRI machine. So you'd be familiar with the tube version of an MRI machine that you lie in. Um, this is an, a version of an MRI machine that you wear on your head so that neuroscientists can, uh, they can study us while we're in the, in the process of actually doing something. So the subject's wearing one of these. They were put into a room facing a screen and told that they were going to be playing a game which involves throwing a virtual ball between themselves and two other people who are sitting in front of screens elsewhere. Now, there were, in fact, no other people playing this game, but the subject of the experiment doesn't know this. And in round one, they're told, I'm awfully sorry, we've got some technical difficulties. Would you mind just sitting there for a moment and watching the other two people throwing this ball backwards and forwards in front of you while we sort out the technical Technical difficulties. So what of course is happening at that point in the experiment is that they are taking a baseline about what happens in the person's brain while they're watching these supposedly other two people throw this ball backwards and forwards. In round two of the experiment, they're told, 
okay, we've sorted out the technical difficulties, you now can join in. So they begin to throw this virtual ball randomly backwards and forwards between themselves and what they believe to be two other human beings. But after a few minutes, the other two people start to throw the ball backwards and forwards between them again. So they're in fact watching the identical thing to what they believe to be people throwing a ball backwards and forwards between them. But in round one of the experiment, they believed they could not participate. And in round two, they believed that they were being deliberately excluded by two other human beings. And all the pain centers in their brain lit up like a Christmas tree. Exactly the same pain centers that light up when you thump your thumb with a hammer. So when I first read about this experiment, I thought that's just extraordinary. But also I thought, why would the human brain prioritise social pain, so the pain of exclusion or rejection from a group, in the same way that it prioritises physical pain? That seems counterintuitive. But actually, it makes perfect sense if you think about the reasons why. So many of us were taught Maslow's hierarchy of needs when we were at school. You remember the triangular-shaped model that had food, water and shelter at the bottom of it? as the most basic needs of human beings. Seems pretty self-evident, you know, easy to, to agree with. All of the latest neuroscience is suggesting that actually that isn't quite right. That in fact, the most basic need of human beings is to belong in a group. We are deeply hardwired to belong to tribes, to groups. And there's a very good evolutionary reason for it. 80,000 years ago, around about the time that we acquired the ability to speak and our cultural evolution began. At that point in our biological evolution, if we were not a member of a group, we would not get access to food or water or shelter and we would die. So our subconscious minds still believe that if we don't belong, we will die. And this message is being sent to us in subtle and not so subtle ways all the time. The implication is this. So I love this photograph. Um, and this is essentially the human condition in one photograph. Clearly, the, the little girl on the right is not happy. Um, there was a TV commercial some years ago in Australia where there was a thing about not happy Jan. So as far as I'm concerned, the little girl on the right needs to be called Jan. This is us. I would love to be able to tell you that human adults are more uh, sophisticated than this, but at a subconscious level, this is going on for us all the time. And whilst we are not the only social species on our planet, uh, we are the uh, primary social species, one would, one would assume, but we're not the only one by any means. There are a number of other social species. This next photograph shows an example of a, of a tiny monkey that has chosen what it believes to be another monkey over food. And there are lots of examples of social species choosing to be with other members of their species rather than food or water or shelter. So there are implications of this for us in organisational culture. Here's how it looks in a model. We behave our way to belonging whether we're doing it consciously or often unconsciously. So when we join a new group, we have evolutionary superpowers that enable us to look at the behaviour in detail of the group that we have joined. Very, very quickly, we can observe and notice the tiniest details, nuances of behaviour in that group. But we are not just watching the behaviour of the rest of the group. We are evaluating for ourselves what is successful behaviour in the group that we have joined? Let me give you a concrete example. I have worked for organisations where uh, it was very common for the most senior person in the room to leave the meeting before the end. In that particular culture, they earned belonging by being busy. Busy equaled important, busy equaled status, busy equaled power, busy earned belonging. And therefore, when they left five minutes to the hour, the people who were there left behind after they um, left the room, those people would, you know, nod knowingly. Well, of course, they would leave. They are busy. They have got something else to do. That's completely normal. 
So that behaviour in that context, in that culture, increased that person's belonging. But I've also worked in organisations where that identical behaviour, senior leader leaves the room five minutes before the end of the meeting, would have been considered the height of unprofessional, would have been considered a person who clearly doesn't value the time of their colleagues, clearly doesn't value making next steps and accountabilities clear. And when that person left the room, there would be some version of an eye roll in the group left behind. And that behaviour would reduce that person's status, power, belonging in the group. So identical behaviour, but the rules of belonging determine whether the behaviour earns greater belonging or loses belonging. That is where culture lives in the interpretation of the behaviour. We do it ourselves. We experiment with behaviour. So I gave the example before of the days when we used to all go uh, to an office and we used to wonder when we joined a new organisation what was an appropriate time to turn up and what was an appropriate time to leave. So if we showed up at 8.30 on our first day, but about halfway through the morning, you know, about by morning tea time, we figured out that everybody else has been there since 8 o'clock. There is a pretty high likelihood that on day two, we'd be showing up at eight o'clock. So we experiment with our own behavior. Once we've figured out what earns belonging, what does good look like in this specific group, then we begin to experiment with our own behavior. And sometimes it's very conscious, like I'm going to show up at eight o'clock in the morning tomorrow. And sometimes it's unconscious. I worked for a bank for a long time and found myself buying pearls and, you know, beige pumps. Um, no offence to anyone who wears pearls and beige pumps. I still do, by the way. Uh, but we experiment consciously and unconsciously. If the behaviour that we exhibit earns the belonging that we hope it will in our new group, then we embrace those rules of belonging. We go, oh, okay, I know the way things are done around here. We sort of go native, if you like. I don't mean that in an ethnicity way. I mean in any joining of any group. We figure it out and we start to adopt the behaviour that is successful in that group. And then something really interesting happens. Let's say I was joking around before about the little girl. Maybe she's uh, she's called Jan. She's grown up and she is now the queen of the accounting system in her organisation. Everybody loves Jan. She knows how that accounting system works. She can make it sing. And she's the go-to person. She's earned her belonging through the expertise of being queen of the accounting system. If somebody comes along, joins her team, for example, from another organisation and says to her, but in our, in my old organisation, we had a much better accounting system. It was quicker. It was easier. It was less expensive. We should really look into that. Jan's subconscious is going to tell her that she is under threat because she's earned her belonging under a particular set of rules. And now somebody's coming along and suggesting that those rules of belonging should change. Jan is unlikely to go, that's a fantastic idea. Let's totally change our accounting system. What you're likely to see, at least initially, is some version of, gosh, there's been a lot of change recently and actually the old system's not as bad and so on. So, so a lot of the resistance we see to change can be attributed to the fact that people feel that the belonging they've earned may be under threat and they will react for that reason and not for the reasons we sometimes um, assign to them. So the tendency is once you've earned your belonging under a certain set of rules, to try to maintain those rules, to try to keep the status quo around the rules of belonging in subtle and not so subtle ways. We ultimately earn our way to belonging. So I'd like to pause there, if you wouldn't mind, Sean, and just see, I'll stop sharing the screen just for a moment and just see whether we have any questions. So as I asked, you to reflect on at the beginning, does this idea ring true and how is it relevant to your own work? Um, yeah, how does a board form a view on organisational culture? What are some elements that can provide insights? So um, 
Probably the most important thing for me to say is that the mistake I most frequently see boards making when they're trying to measure culture, they will often say to me, don't worry, Fiona, we are measuring culture, we have an engagement survey. So there is an assumption that engagement and culture are the same thing, and they're not. So let me give you a way of thinking about the difference. An engagement survey will measure an employee's experience of the system they are in. Culture is the system. So an engagement survey will tell you whether they like or don't like the system they're in, but it won't necessarily tell you what that system is. So engagement surveys nevertheless are valuable because it is very important to understand whether your employee's experience of the system they're in is positive or negative. And there is all sorts of data sh to show that um, higher engagement is a lead indicator of organizational performance in, in, in lots of different ways. Um, measuring culture, in my view, there are a number of surveys that are available commercially. Um, one is Denison, I quite like, D-E-N-I-S-O-N, -E if you're interested in this. Um, you're also welcome, this is a long conversation, so you're welcome to contact me afterwards if you'd like to have that at, at greater length. Um, there are others. Uh, I did one with McKinsey once, the Organisational Health Inventory, which was exceptional, but um, perfect for a very large organisation. For a small one, it's um, more like mowing the lawn with a Sherman tank, so um, scale and, and scope would need to be carefully considered. But I believe that uh, the best way is to have a mixture of qualitative and quantitative research and in qualitative research, I'd be having some form of some kind of listening post. And the kinds of questions I would be encouraging uh, to be asked around that are questions around um, when you saw the boss sack Harry, why did you think that happened? And then what do you think about that? So in other words, questions that get to what is your interpretation of the behaviour and then what is your reaction to that? That will help you to nail down what is you know, what your people are really thinking and feeling and what earns belonging and what doesn't in the system that you're in. It's a complex space. Obviously, that's why you've asked the question. Uh, it's a complex answer, and there's a whole lot more nuance that I could go into, but that, I think, in the interest of time, um, might have to do us. Let me just read some of these other questions. A uh, uh, great question. How would you change a new board member's induction to take account of the belonging requirement? Um, firstly, uh, I would um, I would prepare the rest of the team, the rest of the board, before that person arrives, and I would do some work around self awareness of what actually are the rules of belonging in this group. So I'd invite you to ask that question. So I'd invite you to reflect on when you joined the board. What were your impressions? How did it feel? Did you feel welcome? Did you feel psychologically safe enough to be able to have a contrary view from the beginning? Um, so I'd, I'd start with that before they even join. Make sure that the rules of belonging in the board are apparent. And if you feel that they are appropriate, if the behaviours that you wish to encourage are the same behaviours that earn belonging, terrific. If the behaviours you would like to see more of are not encouraged or supported by the rules of belonging in the group, then I'd be addressing that before the person arrived. Once they do arrive, I would try to be as, as explicit as possible about what good looks like around here. Um, Organisations, as I'm sure you're all well aware, have lots of signposts for this in the form of vision, mission, value statements are very often shortcuts or shorthand for what is good? What does good look like around here? What earns belonging is another way of thinking about that. So when they join, don't just give them all of the papers they need to read and, and all of the traditional materials, but have a conversation with them about the dynamics of the group explicitly and what you're hoping they will exhibit in their behaviours. So essentially helping them to feel safe enough, psychologically safe enough, socially safe enough on entry, that they can play a meaningful role from the outset. That would be my uh, recommendation. Would rules of belonging be dependent on the leader of the group to initiate? Yes, and. So most of us 
will try to please the person who has the power, whether we're doing it consciously or unconsciously. So if the person at the top of the structure, whatever kind of structure we're in, is, is explicitly or even implicitly suggesting what good looks like around here, anything that they look like they're approving of or condoning or um, ignoring, so poor behaviour that is ignored, for example, will be assumed to be condoned. Behaviour that is exhibited will often be copied. So all of that, everything that you've ever heard and read about the importance of leaders um, leading in terms of behaviour and, and being role models is all true. And it is also true that the interpretation of the behaviour that the leader exhibits does not sit with the leader. The interpretation of the behaviour sits with the group. So the example I gave before, senior leader leaves meeting before the end, the group left behind were evaluating that behaviour as positive or negative. So every person in the system plays a role. So if you are a member of the group and you don't approve of the behaviour of the more senior person, you most of us, I won't speak for you, I'll speak for myself, most of us will find ways of making that known to our colleagues. And so everyone plays a role. It's not just about the person at the top. I've been in situations where I've seen someone who is supposed to have all the power battle for years to try and get the focus in the right area and ultimately fail because senior leaders were too threatened by the change that that person was trying to um, to bring in. <clears throat> I'm just going to read this one. After many years of NGO board work with mainly people of similar age and now now seeking out boards with younger participants, can you discuss some of the age implications of your work? Mm. So young people today have many, many more opportunities to belong than might once have been the case. So, you know, in the olden days, when I was starting out my career, you had your family, you had your friends, and you had your work, pretty much. You might have had a sporting group. You might have had uh, a faith group. Uh, but there weren't that many places where you could belong or not. Nowadays, there is an infinite number of places that young people can belong. And so their connection to the workplace is not still, it's, there's still a paycheck attached and there's considerable status attached, and there's considerable ex you know, experience and all sorts of other lovely things attached. But belonging is no longer so connected to their work. The, and particularly in Australia, actually, I, I don't have the stats to hand on New Zealand, but we're in pretty close to record low unemployment here in Australia. And so they have a lot more choices even in the workplace. So the implications are that they, you. If you want to make them feel like they belong, you have to work a bit harder than you might be used to working. So um, I can give you an example from my own life. My brother used to work for Apple. And the week before he joined Apple, a big parcel arrived on his front doorstep. And in it was every toy you could possibly imagine, all the things. And when he opened his laptop, the first week of meetings was pre-populated with meet and greets with all the people he needed to come to, to get to know. And when he clicked on the second week, a thing popped up and said, we know you're keen, but just get here. And, you know, basically it was a welcome to the family gift. And he felt like he belonged before he even set foot in the door. I'm not suggesting that you should do that for everybody, but definitely pay attention to making sure that they feel like they belong from the very beginning. Um, they have too many options these days to get it from somewhere else. Uh, what is the risk of the cycle of behaviour and what are the benefits, if any? So when you know that this is going on for people, you can work with it instead of against it. So um, silos, for example. Silos, endemic in all organisations, they are tribes. We are hugely, deeply hardwired for that behaviour, for us and them, for joining a group and belonging to it. There's a fascinating piece of research that shows that 
if you put a group of people in a room who have never met each other before, within if you split them down the middle, you say you your your half is the orange team and your half is the purple team, give them a badge to wear or something like that, but they've never met before. It takes less than 10 minutes for them to like and trust their own team more and dislike and distrust the other team more. So we are deeply hardwired for belonging. It takes less than 10 minutes. So how then do we deal with this perennial problem of breaking down silos? If you know that this is how human beings work, then you can work with it instead of against it. So for example, if you want to create some kind of cross-functional team, you need to give them something to belong to, that is something else to belong to, that is not part of their silo. So I've seen brilliant um, examples of CEOs who will create some form of a CEO club, for example, uh, and the membership of that club is dependent on whether the person demonstrates the right behaviours. And the CEO club membership is very explicit. So that is essentially said, I'm going to give, I'm going to create a new tribe deliberately and give people something else to belong to. And then they will have belonging to the horizontal tribe as well as the vertical tribe. So the, the benefits of knowing this is that you can work with it. Um, the risks are that if you ignore it, you will get enormous resistance to change and it will look like it's all very rational but actually what it's mostly about typically is about people feeling socially unsafe, that the, their belonging is being threatened. The human brain cannot distinguish between social pain and physical pain. It is constantly scanning our environment for threats and it will equate those two things. How are we going for the time, Sean? Shall I just keep going? Uh, yeah, keep going. We've got another five minutes. All right. Um, we are a network of neighbourhood houses, very small not-for-profit committees of governance who are volunteers, often with minimal knowledge of governance, such diverse views on culture, suggestions on how we bring them together on this journey. So the question you're asking is a question I get asked a lot. Should we be attempting to combine all of our tribes into one tribe? Should we be trying to get one culture across a large array of different organisations? Uh, or different parts of an organisation. Um, there's even, for example, I've seen the same team in the same organisation, but in two different physical locations. So there's the floor five tribe and the floor four tribe, and they ne never seem to sort of mix. So it's just deeply in us. So the question really is, what is the advantage of trying to get everybody to agree to the same rules of belonging? My view is that there is some benefit to that, but it's sometimes overstated what the benefit is going to be. So I would be advising you to aim for one language with different accents, if you like. So often there will be overarching pieces like a mission statement or a set of values or um, a purpose statement. That is kind of the language. It is the overarching umbrella under which you would hope everybody will operate. But when it comes to an individual team, even if they're the same function but in a different location, it's still valuable to go through a process of translating those signposts into something that is specifically meaningful for them. So, for example, a set of values, I would be encouraging you to have a conversation at that team level about what do those values look like in terms of, of observable behaviours for this team, for the role that we play in the larger system. That then helps to bring some of those larger signposts to life for people. Otherwise, they're the kind of equivalent of a cat poster often. So bringing people together under an umbrella, yes, trying to make everybody have exactly the same rules of belonging is usually usually impossible, first of all, but often counterproductive. What you want is for them to see themselves in the larger system and for it to be meaningful to them. And they'll play the role that they need to play in the system. Um, hope that helps. How are we going? Uh, how would you help a new team who have been amalgamated into our organisation to adjust to new systems? They believe what they did was better. So they're, they earned their status and their belonging in the old world. And um, this is going to sound like an odd analogy, particularly with everything that's going on in the world at the moment. But 
when you think about um, anyone being acquired by anyone else, so emotionally that feels like they are being, you know, invaded <laughs> or taken over, like a, a larger, more powerful adversary um, is trying to take them over. And people fight to maintain what they've got harder than people fight to take something from somebody else. They defend more voraciously than they attack, um, typically. So this team needs to feel safe. They need to feel that they are going to maintain their position in the system in some way. So um, the example I gave before about the woman who was resistant to the new, new um, accounting system, the way to turn her from being an adversary and a resistor to being an advocate and an evangelist sometimes is to train her 10 times more on the new system than anybody else so that she feels like she can become the queen of the new system. Now, I obviously don't have the context of what's happening in this particular situation, what type of team it is or, or, or you know, what they've come into, but help them feel like they belong, help them feel heard. And it is possible that some of what they bring to the table is incredibly valuable. And if they feel heard, they are likely to be less resistant to being uh, to joining into the new tribe. But it runs deep. This stuff runs very deep. Oh, she says, sorry, no. Okay, no problem. Okay, no problem. Um, are we out of time, Sean? Uh, I think it's time to wrap up, Fiona. All right. Um, I'll just give you a couple of very quick final thoughts. Um, so uh, you've seen the model. This is just an image of the matrix for those who um, aren't familiar with the, the movie. All I really want to leave you is, with is the idea that this notion that culture is the rules of belonging is like being in the matrix. If you are living in the matrix but you don't know you're living in the matrix, then you won't see anything because you don't know there is anything to see. But once you know that culture is the rules of belonging, then you can see it and you can ask yourself, are these the rules that we want? And if not, you can do something about changing them. I hope that you have found that helpful. I'll hand back over to you, Sean. Thank you very much. Okay, so this brings us towards the end of the webinar, everybody. Please feel free to reach out to Fiona via her LinkedIn address there and also her email, which you see in front of you. Uh, she's very kindly offered to provide uh, the attendees today with a copy of her book. And Fiona, that's a digital copy or a physical copy, I believe? Yes, so we'll be asking people to make their choice. Right, so uh, feel free to reach out uh, for that there. Our webinar schedule towards the end of the year, uh, we've got some great webinar topics, including leading, linking risk and strategy, what it means for your organization. Uh, and at the very end of the year, we have a very esteemed international research guest on let's go beyond the boards and how to open your, your strategy. So there's some really good topics there. Um, I'll just move back one. We also have our masterclass schedule uh, for uh, December and moving into the first quarter of next year, how to write better board papers, how to be and think strategic with Stephen Bowman, creating a winning board resume with Lisa Cook, and how to be a great chair with Giselle McLaughlin. You'll find all of these masterclass options on our resource center under the webinar page. So, as we leave the webinar today, don't forget to complete our one-minute survey and go into that draw for our hamper with $400. We'll announce the winner uh, shortly after the webinar. And to make it a little bit more interesting, if you pop into LinkedIn, LinkedIn and follow BoardPro, you'll double your chances of winning. So why not have some fun with that today? Thanks again for your attendance, everybody. Thank you to Fiona Robinson. It was fantastic having you with us today. And I hope you all enjoyed the session, everybody. We look forward to seeing you in our next webinar. And that's it for today. Thanks, everybody. Have a great day.